Welcome to our second session of Echos Lab. We are in the middle of Sierra Spuña in Aledo with young ensembles and promoters from different countries to talk about new audiences, what they feel in the concert. We want to explore what audiences is looking for, what kind of experience, what do they think, what do they feel, what do they listen, what do they say, what do they pay attention to in a concert. We want to find new ways to listen to our music, to early music. I am Jorge Rosana, director of Cantoria and the Ecos Festival, and I am with David Gutierrez, flutist from Anacronia, and we are very, very happy to welcome four ensembles uh, from different countries. Um, we want to, to, to introduce you to Entrevescant from Madrid, Barbaroco from Paris, um, Flutes and Freds from London, there they are, and the Gardeners from Berlin. Thank you. We have also four promoter, three promoters from different parts of Europe. We have Deborah Roberts, uh, who is president and director of the Brighton Early Music Festival. Deborah, hello. Thanks for being here. Hello. <laughs> It's lovely to be here. Thank lovely you. to be in Europe. <laughs> yes, welcome. You are always welcome to be with us. Uh, we have also Noelia Gomez from Segovia Early Music, uh, sorry, from the Fundación Juan, Don Juan de Borbón. Hi, nice meeting. We have also Matteo uh, Penazzi from Lugo Music Festival. Hi, nice to meet you. And we are going to start with the questions of today. Before talking about new audiences, we want to know uh, what kind of audiences do you have in your festivals and what kind of audiences do you look for? So, Deborah, how is in Brighton? What kind of people attend your concerts? Well, it won't be surprising, I'm sure, to say that most of them are older. Um, many all are sort of my sort of age group and even older than that. Um, yeah, they are very eclectic in their tastes, I have to say. We always have challenged them. We don't just put on popular music. We always try to take things in a different direction. And I would say that on top of everything, the audience that we most seek isn't necessarily just younger. It's that we want to find the people that we would call curious, the creatively curious, people that like to go to different things. Because I've always maintained that the thing about so-called early music is that it is most of the music that's ever existed. We have around a thousand years of music to offer from every possible walk of life, from every social occasion and for every age group. So we do do concerts, um, luckily in collaboration with the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment called TOTS concerts, which are for toddlers and their parents. So those will be our youngest. I think our youngest audience was six months old. Um, but I'd say our mainstream audience is reasonably curious, but I, I, it's, it's a big dilemma, I think, for everybody that we know that the music that we're doing will appeal. We know that it's attractive to a lot of people, but very often they simply don't know it exists. And everybody lumps classical music as being, that's for somebody else, that's for an elite. It's a very bad problem in England. Um, there isn't the same attitude as I've seen in other countries that says that music is for everybody, culture is for everybody. It gets very, you know, it gets very fraught. But certainly, um, Our audience is evolving a bit. We've got a hard, a very good core of people that come to everything we do. Um, I'd say that they are quite a mixed group of people, but they are still mostly older, whereas most of our performers are younger. So that, that's probably quite quite common thing. That's probably all I can say at the moment. That's very interesting. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, let's listen to Matteo Penazzi. Hi, guys. So I will speak about who is my audience. 
but also I would like to make a question. You don't answer to ask to answer me now. Like, who is the audience of your project? Did you think about um to whom is your project addressed? Like everybody or a segment of population or music lovers? That's a good question that I always make myself as I have 10 concerts um, and I have a different audience for each of them. So I really spend time thinking about, okay, where could I do this concert in a way that I can reach a younger audience? And young means so many things. Young could be five to 12 years old. You know, for me, young means like 20 to 35. That's my perception of being young. Um, but, you know, it has to be very precise beside uh, the, the cell of audience that always comes to whatever I do as, um, my colleague was saying before you know there are people who will come to whatever we do but there are certain people who will pop up according to the place that we decide to do the concert rarely there are people who come according to the content that's it that is also something interesting because this is a site-specific festival and it's all outdoor so um i would say to conclude that like the audience really varies zero to 90 years old but i spend time speaking to the potential audience together with the marketing department um i think this is something the artist shouldn't do spending time with you know promoting or at least should do full time that's why i stopped practicing because i didn't have time to promote what i did uh so I like spending my old 100% of my time to speak with a potential target. And as I said, each event for me has a different target. Besides the fact that certain people will come to whatever I will do. So I prefer to keep it short for now so that we will have for more time to discuss together. Thank you, Mateo, very much. And we also want to listen to Noelia from the Fundación Juan de Borbón. In, in our case, we also have mainly uh, people that are from their uh, middle 40s in advance. But we, we also organize um, many things for families and for children, because I'm convinced that uh, that's very important to create, a, to build a new audience from the, from the childhood. So we also have a big, uh, uh, we also pay attention to that. To that part as well, and uh, um, we also have our, our eclectic organized different concerts. Not only early music, we also do contemporary, other kinds of cl classical music, and even flamenco and dance, other things. And I have found that uh, people, uh, our audience, like the mixture, the mixture of things: music with poetry, music with dance, music with with theater, with titeres, uh, I don't know how to say in, in English uh, that, but so we also, the combination of different uh, arts, uh, it, it's important for us and for, for our audience as well. And um, we don't have a concert hall, the same as uh, Mateo was saying, uh, we are site specific in every of the events we, we do. And I have found out as well that it is important this part uh, for for our audience, they they get curious and they get excited about which places we are going to to use for programming the concerts, especially the ones in the rural areas or natural landscapes that we that we sometimes uh, decide to use for the concerts. That is very nice, Noelia. Thank you very much. Uh, we have heard about curiosity 
about concepts, about uh, about places and other arts, and I'm very very happy to listen to all those because here uh, we are here to discuss what to do with to to seek um, how to combine this these elements and what do you do in your festivals or what can we do in our festivals because these conferences are also. Um, um, will be also watched by promoters uh what can we do to to, to seek new experiences uh, we have been talking the last day in, in these residences and the in echoes we are now in the aledo town hall that have made possible together with territories Raspuña and the university of murcia we have been talking about uh, what can we do as a musicians and as a festivals uh, to 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 find new ways to to discover early music classical music dance and all the all what you do in your festivals and i would like to ask you um do the format of classical concerts or early music concerts have to change and if you say yes um what do what do they have what do we have to do to 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 make the audience feeling what they want to feel And what is what they want to feel also in the in the concerts? Uh, so, Matteo, maybe you want to to start. Uh, well, um, I saw everybody's profile, so I uh, I really love the way you look, the way you are, and the way you play. So, thanks for sharing your social media and everything else. Um, let me focus about the question. Uh, I think yes, it should change, and. Uh, I like to learn from pop music in a way that why would you go to a go play a concert from Coldplay? Do you all know Coldplay? Yeah. Okay, and pay whatever amount of money when you would be able to or any pop band, sorry for just mentioning one, but um when you would be easily able to uh click on Spotify with your big bozy, you know, sound box at home. Uh, so because I'm looking for an experience, an experience of lights, I'm looking for an experience of show, uh, including music, of course. And then they add, these guys are really awesome. They add smoke and whatever around it and mm, bracelets, you know, I think you saw some pictures of the last stadium concerts um, and they are looking for a connection, people who are paying a huge ticket. They're looking for a connection. They they have this sense of belonging uh, because they are they know there will be like 20,000 people or 40,000 people. So I think the classical format of concerts should change in a way that promoters uh, promote the experience uh, beyond the content, beyond the Pergolesi, Vivaldi, Frescobaldi, whoever, you know, And promoting the experience would would mean, as an example, you know, the Marco Polo journey. And you could put whatever repertoire beyond that name. And that uh, clicks in people's minds the, the willingness to experience a journey, a story. And th that's what kids like, you know, children. Would you like to hear a story? Mom, I would like to hear a story before going to bed. So as an, as an adult, I also want to hear stories. And that's what people are looking for while they're scrolling, scrolling on social media and newspapers. So promoting the, the story and the experience is very much more powerful for me instead of the repertoire. They can go together. They can get along. But what I miss from artists um, sending me hundreds of proposals every year, uh, beside the fact that they uh, claim to be cool and I agree with that, and they look beautiful and I agree with that, what I miss as a promoter is having artists offering uh, an experience, a story, uh, a title which is more powerful than any Uh, Pergolesi Stabat Mater or Medioevo repertoire, uh, which it can, of course, be in the proposal. But uh, yes, thanks for the question. I hope that I was clear enough. 
totally clear. I think we were very happy because the word story came yesterday. It was the, the most spelled uh, like hundreds of times. We would talk. I think we will do a next year uh, storytelling and early music uh, workshops. And I will ask you later about that. But first, let's listen to Deborah. Um, what she has to say about what the audience feel in the concerts. I, I, I love what Matteo had to say about experience. I would say that I would add to the experience two words. One would be context, definitely, and the other connectivity. And maybe I mean connectivity in, in a slightly different way from him because I like to feel that we're offering something that's different from popular music. And if you think about its context, there were no concerts when most of the music we perform actually existed. So sticking a load of people in a hall and sticking some artists on the stage, I find a little bit dead. It can work for some people and work for some repertoire. But if you actually think, where was this music performed? And for what sort of people, what kind of occasion, what sort of building? And if you can start to work on that, and you can actually help that by using a lot of multimedia, things like film, um, we've done the Florentine Intermedia, 1589, with, with um, aerial dance and, you know, with flying across the, the sky and, and everything. And amazing light shows and things that we've done as well. We did a program of Hildegard where we had somebody who's who actually mostly works in the rock world, but he did a kind of pyrotechnic display, which was like the headache um, migraine visions that Hildegard saw. So I think people came and they were quite, we called it Hildegard transfigured. And I think that was giving an experience that was just connecting just a little bit more. And most of all, we are always human beings. We were in the past, we are now. Um, society tries to shape us, but we still have the same emotions. And that's really what I'm after. I want to reach those emotions whether it's a motet by Josquin de Pré or whether it's a Beethoven symphony even, not that we've had those at the festival, but the emotion that, that people are feeling will connect with the, the same people that felt that hundreds of years ago, that we are always human. And I think that, that says it all to me. When, when we've managed to put on free events, which we did once in a very, very beautiful church in Brighton, and we were able to just let people come in. And we had different stages with different music going on. People lay on the floor and they just spoke at the end. We said, you have a piece of paper. You know these post-it notes you can stick on a board. Just write a few words about what it made you feel. And it was the most incredible project because we have we had such positive comments from people who had never ever heard this sort of music before. They were really moved. People were walking out in a day saying, I've never heard anything like that before. I feel that this, I, that, that completely changed my whole approach. I thought then we haven't got to be apologetic about this music and say, well, when you grow up and you get older, you might learn to love this, this strange classical early music. No. I actually think, let's be more defiant. Let's say we are offering most of the music that's ever, ever been composed from the earliest times. We are proud of it and everybody has a right to access it. So we want people to walk away feeling connected with humanity through time and through space. It's only a small thing to hope for, but <laughs> that's about it really. Thank you very much, Deborah. That was very, very inspiring. Let's listen to Noelia. Well, I, I agree with everything that that both Deborah and Matteo have said already. And I want I would like to add that I also the con the word connection I think is important for 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 trying to, to get closer to what they may feel. Mm, so th this music and this music is very is far away in the time and it's difficult for people who are not who are not specialized in it to connect uh, with it and that's why I, I'm sorry for the dogs 
that's why the, the storytelling is very important. And also I think that the connection could be made with participation somehow. We could find ways to make uh, our, our audience participate on it in the, in the, in the process of the, of the concert. Also, sometimes we, we combine the concerts with other, with other um, experiences uh, to make it more interesting for new audiences who might in who, who may be not so interested in the concert or the content itself, but in the whole experience. Like for instance, uh, we have made concerts in the on the top of a mountain, and the only way to get there was by these chairs. Is is a sky a sky place? So you have to go in these chairs to go sky sky skin. Um, that was very interesting. All in a or in an old. Um, train station as well, an abandoned train station, people had to hike there or things like this, make it interesting for new audiences as well. So it's the complete experience is not only the concept, the storytelling of the of the concert itself, but also everything that surrounded it. That's very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, uh we were talking about the what is around the concert uh and we also believe well in, in here in Eco Serraspuña <laughs> we we think also the places are very important i also in, in lugo festival we know that they do very very different uh um, locations i know how is it in brighton do you do the, all the concerts in the same places or do you also find uh new venues and and unexpected venues deborah We used a different venue for almost every event. I mean, we, we we don't have a venue. So we use a lot of churches because, well, they're cheap to hire. It's also they have nice architecture and they have nice acoustics. But we've also done concerts out of doors in a park. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I was just trying to think. Um, well, we've obviously we've done quite a few concerts online as well, where we've actually had film as the background. Um, we've done concerts in medieval barns. Um, I, th I think just we're always looking for new places. In fact, I think it can get very dull if you always go to the same place, though it's much easier to organise, of course. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to, to, to ask to Matteo, why is it uh, storytelling? Why is a story so important? What, what Was it always like that? Has something changed? Or... Uh, why is the story becoming? We 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 were talking just today, uh, some of us. It looks like, as you said, the con the concert itself, the music itself, becomes less important. Why? Uh I think the education has changed in a way that two centuries ago people were educated to hiden, and therefore were waiting for the moment to listen to their favorite hero that somebody talked to them about in school. Ah, education is always the key of everything, you know. Uh, if I think of my music teachers, my music taste is a lot according to them. My open-mindedness to jazz and folk, uh, ethnic music is a lot on my music teachers. So... And of course, the speed of our lives. And you were mentioning attention. Doing a two hours concert is not is not possible anymore. Uh, you need three breaks maybe, and two snacks and one cocktail. Um, so the way I promote events and I choose the contents for the organization that I represent, because I'm not I'm I'm not living in central Paris and promoting the Champs Elysees, whatever, um, who has a high budget and doesn't worry about the audience. Uh, that's usually how it works with all the institutions, according to my experience. So I have a small budget, I'm a nonprofit. Um, and therefore, I'm struggling on new strategies on how to promote the contents through the storytelling. 
and the power of stories, I think, is uh, part of the human nature. Uh, as I was saying before, I hear stories as I'm as I am a kid, and that makes the difference for the rest of my life. Uh, a story as a beginning and a an end, as the good and the bad, the old and the young. The story has everything, um, as well. It should be the audience. For me, the potential audience should be everyone. Eventually, I told you, each event is custom customized for a different target. But eventually, uh, so many different people come to each event. So, also the motto is music for everybody, and. Um, yeah, that's it. You mentioned the word attention, that two hours concert is no longer possible. Uh, what do you do, Matteo? I, I will continue with, with, with you because we are very, very interested in that. What is the other option? What do you do in Lugo Festival to, to not only to promote the story, but what changes are you doing in your locations? Because I think your festival is very uh, close to ours uh, in, in terms of kind of audiences. And, and this is maybe the audience that uh, Deborah was looking for, curious uh, um, audiences that are not used to, to attend concerts. Uh, so what do you do, Matteo? And afterwards, I will also ask to Noelia and, and Deborah to, to, to change the experience of the audience, a part of the story. Okay. Here you have an example, a move. All right, this is again Vivaldi, Four Seasons, another year, another edition of the festival. This is like 1,500 people, 6 a.m. Um, the experience and the story is you wake up very early. Like people wake up 5.20, last minute, 5.35. They get their bike or car. And it's summer. So it's not Spanish summer, it's Italian summer. So it's less degrees but still around 38 degrees degrees celsius and the story is you wake up early you enjoy the um, the, um, the freshness of early morning uh, i'm not saying early music because i think that's calling old people so i never mention er the word early i just say early early morning is dawn is when the sun goes up and the story is already beautiful you know and the light is so beautiful and you can see the changes of the light from blue to pink to red to orange to yellow and finally to light blue. So you enjoy the experience of changing of the lights and uh, of a beautiful place from the heritage. This is a monument. Uh, I'm actually uh, saving money because I don't have to um, rent any stage equipment. The stage is already there. And the experience is you are in the main square. Concert is one hour because then people need to have breakfast at seven and then they need to go to work at eight. So, you know, people say 45 minutes is a lot. It's like what you can get uh, the 100% attention from a person. But I think with concerts, it can go a little bit up, especially if it's part of an experience, including, you know, breakfast in the bars. And people are so polite and well-educated. They stay quiet. They don't make any noises beside one dog maybe every year. But uh, they are also getting education, edition after edition. And so that's why my way to customize the experience, you know, making it shorter and adding some other items and partnerships because bar bars are great partners and want to invite artists and tell them you know you can have breakfast in this beautiful skirt as an additional value um, um yeah uh, i mean that's the image of what i told you thank you very much uh mateo that looks very very nice and we can imagine the colors Noelia, you were talking about what is around the concert, but what about the concert itself? How do you how do you keep attention or what can we do? Is there any new format, any new way to listen to classical early music 
uh, in this 21st century with this uh, attention uh, in capacity changing uh, year by year? I wanted to go a little bit back to the question you asked Mateo before because uh, that it's it's mostly I think it it uh, answers both the one before and this what I'm going to say because I wanted to make an observation which is it's gonna it's gonna sound kind of basic but I think it's important to keep it in mind um, so when we say why do we need a story why do we need an experience why do we need to go out of this kind of just showing the repertoire which is beautiful and we we all agree about it and it shouldn't need any kind of of like paper or content you know it wouldn't it wouldn't need nothing else than that but the thing is that since we have this new era with youtube and spotify um, the fact that recordings are there is even it has amplified uh, to the infinitum because um people used to have cds at home but not everything, and then you you go to live music as well to concerts. But now you have access to everything, and and many people would, who are not music lovers or who are not specialized like, like musicians uh, would say. Many people has asked me this, especially young young uh, people. Why do we have to go to a concert that I can listen in Spotify? Because when I go to see to to listen to Coldplay. It's not the same to have at home uh, the speakers that to go to the concert. There is another whole experience that the concert has and I cannot have at home. But they have the idea that this is not the same with classical music, that it is almost the same to go to the concert or to listen to it at home. And this is something I wanted to share with you, this, this thought, because um, having this basic thing in mind might give us some roots about what to offer as ensembles, as, a, as an experience. I want to play this repertoire, I like this repertoire, but how can I connect each piece? And how can I make a whole thing that makes it interesting for my audience to go to the concert instead of listen to me at home? Even though if I have on Spotify, if I have a recording, there might be people that say, okay, I, I already can listen to them. So th this observation I wanted to make. And, and this basic observation is what makes me trying to look for new things that I already said before, no? like the site specific places, experiences that, that go out of the music, that how do you get to the concert? How do you go out of the concert? If you have a breakfast afterwards, like Mateo says, or in our case, a wine bar, or we, we organized an archeologic route before one uh, one concert with a with a duo, a soprano and a piano, that was uh, beautiful to go to the mountain and to see all those ruins with a with some special route to to learn about those things as well. And other thing that I also think that is important to add to the experience is the information to give uh, you give to the public. Um, so information like the one you have in the program, no? In the before the concert, you you can have a conference to 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 explain about it. We have uh, audiences usually like that a lot as well to to have maybe half hour or twenty minutes of 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 a conference in the same place that the concert is going to be right before, and it's not like obliged to go there is just optional but usually we have found out that people go to that conference that optional um, thing that we have before the concert um, that's another thing we do as well and it works well it works well to to talk during the concerts to to try to make that connection also with poetry or with some information that the group might be my might give to the audience so they can have more relation with the music they are listening to all those kind of things, I have found that they are useful for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noelia. So just, uh, I want to ask you again. So we, you would like, you do, I understand, to you keep the experience of the concert as it is, and then you change the time, or you would like to change, as Mateo said, the time, the experience before, the experience after, but the experience of the concert remains, right? doesn't have to be. <laughs> I think that uh, 
it is so conservative what we do that we are playing the same music and trying to to well to present this this old music to this early music for, uh, to people that even though if we try to break our limits there will be always more limits so there was a question that some group had had um, had um, written down for this i think that pushing our limits is is a uh, is a good thing and i i like to to think like that because i i have the feeling that even if i push my limits there might be more limits that i'm not that I'm not seeing at the horizon right now. So, so I, I like to, to work that way. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noelia. What about Brighton and the UK? Deborah, do we, uh, we are talking about storytelling, experiences, attention? Yes. I mean, <laughs> interesting what, what Matteo was saying about being able to put on a concert at dawn in a beautiful Italian square. I think actually this whole context, I mean, I know Italy quite well because I partly lived there for a while and we put on quite a lot of concerts in a little town called Triora. And we also put them on in the square after a music course and there would be a pair of TV served uh, before or after the concert. And everybody came because it was a great big social occasion and we did about an hour of music. Um, this isn't Brighton, of course, but it's it's interesting how different countries will have different spaces where that's possible. And what in Britain we don't really have that concept of the piazza, and it, it's such a pity because we we are always having to, also we have English weather, so we end up having to be indoors for almost everything we do. We have tried outdoor concerts, um, in fact, during just well during the the worst of the pandemic, we did put on quite a lot of events in a park where we tried to get a kind of rock festival feel to it. Um, we hoped it would attract all sorts of different people, but it, it didn't particularly, and people were still a little bit reluctant. Um, it, stories are incredibly important, and I think that all of historic music has a story to tell. It really does. Um, this year, one of the chief things that we're doing at the festival is a program called the Whispering Dome, which is following the flight of some migrating birds from Britain down into West Africa, and then picking up the music on the route. But we're also having a, a giant scrim, which is like an enormous screen, where we're projecting the journey and showing films and images of this, of this journey. We have children from schools who are going to work with the two African musicians and learn some of the some of the songs oh i mean it's going to it's going to be chaotic but um i think there we are telling a story also about migration and saying that that there isn't only birds that migrate and the birds are flying over forest fires and all sorts of climate change destruction we've got a very big story at the moment that, that's very important to me which is trying to save the human race from it, destroying itself yes well, the birds fly, people move. It's a natural thing that people have always, everybody's a migrant. Every human being has moved around the world and that's how stories have spread. So, so we will have in the songs that are sung, each of them may well tell a story. It might be about a hippopotamus in a village, which we, we've had one of those before, it's a beautiful story. Um, but I mean, that, that's it really. Uh, Thank you, okay. Deborah. Deborah. Matteo wants to, to say something before we listen to the ensembles and what they think about that. Yeah, let me add that my request to every musician who comes to my festival is to speak because the audience always listens to your instruments but rarely knows how your voice sounds like. And I know my audience they they didn't go to the conservatory uh, to any music school. They maybe have learned uh, Fiorelliza when they were children, uh, and it's always like dee, 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 the same old story. So they they don't know what music is about, you know. And just telling them in the beginning of the concert that you are playing on gut strings is such a, is such a story itself. I mean, you're used to, but it's mesmerizing to hear that story that you're playing on gut strings. And I think as musicians, you're 
responsible of sharing that knowledge uh, to the audience. That's at least what I'm always uh, asking. And I find it beautiful that the audience is aware of the things that you touch with which you communicate the feelings. Somebody was talking about the feelings. That's very, very nice, uh, Matteo, and very inspiring. Also for us, we are looking for, for new ways to, to present this music and we will take this speaking and telling stories. But what is important for flutes and frets? Uh, what did you think of what we heard today, uh, Beth, from Flutes and Frets from London? Yeah, thank you for, for sharing all that you've, you've shared. Um, it's really interesting to hear all of your perspectives and especially what stood out to me is is the the definition that you have a such a broad definition on story not just the story of a particular program but of the setting of a, of a place not only the venue but the time of day of the concert and all these things um yeah i've never thought of that being a part of the story um so yeah it's really interesting to think that the artist and the promoter can collaborate potentially on those things coming to a, a decision about what's going to attract audiences um in those things as well as the repertoire um something that we've um found interesting is uh addressing formality of of classical music concerts things like uh, not only dress code and things like that, but audiences sitting in rows, uh, speaking during performances. Um, and yeah, we'd be interested to know your thoughts on those kind of things, whether, whether, um, whether you think it's important for a, uh, an artist to be on the stage, uh, for, for an audience to sit in silence or all of these kind of aspects. To, to a performance is there any um is there any comments about that uh maybe noel deborah please i think we have to remember that quite a lot of music written in the past was not intended to be listened to in silence i think quite a lot of it frankly is quite dull a lot of it is new meant to be a background we have a lot of that now, and I think it existed then. And I think we have to not expect too much of audiences to sit through. And I'm not going to mention any composers because <laughs> too dangerous. But um, I think we should be very, very careful about not expecting everyone just to sit there rigidly silent, unable to move. Um, I mean, we often have, have, have had our audiences sitting at tables with a bottle of wine. That always feels a bit better. But to just say that your own love of your music might not quite get get across to the audience. Thank you very much, Deborah. We also have uh, Santiago from the Gardeners uh, from Berlin. Uh, what, what do you think, Santiago, about the discussion? Um, I found interesting uh, your question, Jorge, asking... Uh, why do we need now a story and before would uh, the the music itself uh, be kind of sufficient? But actually, I think that we always needed a story. Uh, even now, when we think about the last century, uh, orchestras playing Brahms, Mahler, I think the story was the great orchestras. They were appearing from that. So we would be interested on in going to see the Berliner uh, playing Brahms and see what how do they do this? Um, and I think just that those, I mean, I being in Berlin and having studied in Berlin, I come also, I come from the modern piano first. And I, of course, I, I love to go and to listen to, to, to Brahms and to the Berliner. But somehow I feel that it was always the same story for since like many decades. And I think that was kind of the problem now. And somehow we needed new stories. And uh, in the time of Haydn, the story was that Haydn was composing in that time. So we were waiting every week for a new creation. Now they're dead. So and now it's not about the creation of their compo of these composers. Now it's kind of the, the, the albums. Actually, we wait for 
uh, I don't know, for ensembles, uh, new ensembles like La Tempête or Pygmalion, uh, they, they take a new CD and what are, what are, what are they going to do now with this music? Uh, and uh, after that, the, well, we were also saying uh, that uh, what we do is conservative. I've heard uh, uh, from Noelia that we play composers that died already and that uh, like old music and and that we ask the people to come and to listen for 35 minutes, one hour, one hour and a half, uh, the music. But actually, I also don't find that it's actually necessarily conservative because Coldplay, when they come, they don't play 35 minutes. They play one hour and a half. So actually, people are able to go and to listen for one hour and a half of music. And I think the the very interest the, the main point I've been hearing is like the, the, the story... And we, yesterday we were talking about bridges uh, and also about connectivity. Um, I think the interesting thing is to understand what are our stories from today and uh, and to understand then what are the cores for us to build these stories. So what, what do we need now? What is the content of the stories that we can use artistically to create with this? So what kind of dances we, we connect now with? What kind of lights? What kind of vocabulary and those connecting with early music or any kind of music actually make this music not conservative because we can then create with them and they become then modern so it's very important for us to to go on the other side and to inspire ourselves for from what we feel that the audience is seeking, but as an artistic tool, not as a compromise that we should take in order to please them. Like to, to take this inspiration and to say, uh-huh, then I create the bridge with what I'm presenting and I may I add something and I put a value uh, artistically. I am exploring in this direction. Um, yeah, that was kind of my observation from what I heard. That is very interesting, Santiago. Uh, let's compare later a concert of Coldplay with our concert and see what happened. But I don't know what Noelia or Mateo thinks about what you just heard. They agree. Let's listen to what Liv or not, but then let's listen first to to Livia to from Entrevescant, what she thinks about the matter of today. Hi. Okay, so uh some of the things that have been said are really essential to us. I think, uh, for me personally, what you said, Deborah, about the human needs that are still, we are still humans and we still have the same needs that this music was composed to, to address. So what I believe also that has also been said is that sometimes when we perform in a traditional concert form format certain certain kinds of music we are not allowing that music to cover the need that it was intended to cover so if the music is meant to be danced we should allow the audience to dance and we still have the need to sing the need to sing together with people because sometimes you sing along in your house but not often you sing with 60 other people and it's a really beautiful experience they need to dance, they need to dance with people. And so I think looking into the original purpose of the music we perform and trying to honor it is one of the most powerful um, strategies. And then I also found, found in interesting what Mateo said about the different segments. Today, uh, yesterday we were talking with other programmers um, one brought the interesting problem that sometimes the donors, she was from North America, so they have a lot of private donors, and those donors are elder, elderly people. And she said, maybe if I do a, a concert aimed for young audiences, I will lose these donors. But what Mateo said about thinking different concerts for different segments, I think it's really interesting, and I also think that if you can spot a segment that is especially difficult for you. Maybe you need to do a special effort and do a concert focused for that segment. And after, 
several experiences, maybe they will go to the other concerts that are not, not especially meant for them. And I think it was us with the question about the boundaries. Uh, we have participated in some projects uh, a little bit different. Uh, we played historical dances at pubs with electronic uh, artists. Uh, and that was really super cool. And we were in Madrid at three in the morning and people were dancing early music and that was amazing. And I love doing that, but I also like doing concerts. So that was the question because what we do in that context, it's not a concert. It's a cool musical experience, but it's something completely different. And regarding participation, especially, I find it's difficult to find the balance uh, between the concert and the completely different thing, the party, which is a great thing, but a different thing. Uh, and also, uh, it's interesting about the recordings and YouTube, Spotify, and how it changes to go to a concert. I think that's especially hard for people. I don't know, an orchestra is playing Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, and that's recorded by the best musicians in wherever you want to listen. Uh, for us, I think all of us here, and maybe especially us, uh, it's a good thing because not all early music is recorded. In our case, uh, some of it, it's only recorded or by Jordi Zaval or by some ethnomusicologists who went to a little village in the 80s. So I think that's a big, great thing that we all here have. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for all the knowledge and everything you, ser you shared. <laughs> so I was so amazed by your, um, what is that? Yeah, I have it with me. So uh, I love your picture, and uh, I would like to share my reaction to your picture, um, which is beautiful, of course, but I think working on different backgrounds, yours is in a church, right? Yeah, I can see the candle. Working of using different pictures to promote different uh, experiences you can offer would be great for me as a promoter uh you mentioned you did something in the city and i'm and uh, sometimes paying a hundred euro a man doing a very cool seven megabyte one gigabyte picture uh it makes your career in in terms of you know uh engagements and commitments for the future i mean uh, jobs um so like for me, having a promo pack from an artist, having his band in a forest, um, in a school, in the city, in a very ancient church uh, would mean like, oh, OK, these guys are very much flexible. And I can, you know, right now, most of the subsidies are on green, young, these kind of things. So people might be very interested on you promoting uh legends from the forest i can see you are uh yeah i was like reading your motivational letters uh, we are passing information between each other and i can see you're really interested on promoting legends and historical figures so why not pay, taking a picture in the forest because you want to talk about stories from historical myths and legends and that's so crucial for uh, the, the young audience i mean very young even children and school projects and uh, environmental project people taking care of the environment might call you even if they don't promote early music and you might have the chance to know people in a different network while you are in a forest um, and playing your own new album. So I think uh, the way you communicate, I mean, I'm talking about Antrebescan, but it's, I think it's for my own classical band and for everybody's band. Uh, the way we promote our image nowadays is crucial. You'll have you'll have very cool Instagram profiles, and uh, and because you know that's how it works today, through the eyes. That's very nice, and I'm I'm very very happy that that you are giving them a feedback because this is also the. The thing, the thing of of this echo slab that they can receive a, a, a feedback. 
But um, I wanted to to ask you uh, because here Santiago from from the Gardeners said that people can be one and a half uh, one and a half hour listening to a, a Coldplay concert, uh, but they are not only listening. Uh, what is the difference of a uh, of an of a pop music or a rock music experience from the perspective of the audience, and what can we learn from that? What can we apply? There has been spoken by Beth, and you know, uh, people can speak, but what is what is different, uh, and and what can we save or what can we copy, and we, what do what can we not? I don't know if some of you or maybe even Santiago want to to say something. Santiago. Um, I think uh, what we what is difficult to copy is the creation maybe of new music. I don't know if in the concert of Coldplay, people I mean they play actually already music that exists for like already maybe twenty years and people already know it, uh, but they're still alive they are artists which are alive so we when we go and listen to Bach well he's not alive anymore so maybe that's the thing that we can't really uh, copy but uh, I think the um, what we can try to inspire ourselves from is the language from 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 nowadays uh, the the sonorities I find that for example the the sonorities of early music instruments are being also rediscovered because we find them especially modern, very interesting, uh, and that they can blend into new sounds, new sonorities uh, in a very, very interesting way. Uh, for example, I have been trying to write in like in in a modern folk way uh, for early music instruments, and I find that actually it becomes super interesting because then we kind of discover new sonorities in a language that we have the feeling that we already know uh, but it kind of the blend kind of creates something new and then we discover then something new sonorities and then this is this becomes already a bridge because then with this we can uh, put it in resonance with uh, a piece from for example that w something that we play from Geminiani and he the composer who was inspired from uh, Scottish airs. So we hear uh, folk music from the 17th century and then folk music from nowadays with some minimalistic patterns uh, whatsoever and then we, we create this bridge and we experience the music um, in the same moment and then we actually believe we, we, we experience the, the, the modernity and both become actually as modern as uh, as the other one so that's something that we can inspire ourselves from and then also from the people i mean from the experience of going uh, the context is different we don't go and we don't sit so as i said like this is a story that i've been repeating for a very long time uh, for the last decade we go and we sit in the philharmonie to listen to uh, this uh, orchestra playing this music that we kind of already the society already knows in a certain way and um, I think, yeah, experiencing the music in 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 other contexts, uh, it is something that. But understanding what is the context that we need now, also. Oh, uh, uh, I mean, coming from Berlin, I think it's a city where can, I learned a lot from, um, like, reurbanization uh, from fabrics from places uh, that we uh, connect with clubs, but also then from uh, that clubs become also. Uh, con uh, concert venues. Yeah, that's an observation. Thank you, Santiago. Um, I don't know if you saw a video. I watched a video from for the last week. There is ten thousand people in a concert in Holland jumping, uh, with a symphonic orchestra singing. Lo, 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 lo. So really shouting, I won't say singing. Uh, it sounds quite good because they are Dutch and they all sing good. But uh, um, it's like 10,000 people 
jumping with someone they all know. Just like it was said, I don't remember by whom. I think it was uh, Arthur from from An Improviso in Poland. He said, "Is these melodies? Um, I have everyone knows them and are very important for them. Like we really feel related to the music that that we listened, but." Uh, I, I wanted to be more concrete. I, I will ask Deborah because she was also saying that this music was not play, uh, thought in the, for, for concerts like we understand them today. I, 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 I would like you to, to tell us what do you think we could take from this concert? Really, really concrete, like should the people stand? Should the people talk? I think also regarding young audiences, why do they come to a concert? I think Thing, and I'm not here to say what, what what I think, but my question is, what do they want there? They want to communicate with the other people. They want just to listen. How can we, how can we make the audience interact between them while they are listening to music? <laughs> That's a very very good question. And I, just harking back to something being talked about earlier, that I think stadium rock, we're never going to be able to quite capture that atmosphere. With early music, with with any classical music, really, you might get that occasional. I, I love the idea of the Ode to Joy and things like that might happen occasionally. But we are dealing with something that is much much smaller scale. And I think too, um, we can't we can't hope to compete with it, but we shouldn't at the same time be ashamed of what we can do. And I think that we find it in Brighton that one of the things that's key to attracting our audiences is that it feels like a family. It's a very, very friendly festival. Anybody who comes to it can immediately feel part of the audience. We always ask artists to speak with the audience at the same time. We try to, to position them in such a way that it's possible to get closer to the performers as much as possible. So you can actually see what they're doing. And to see performers interacting with one another rather than staring at their music is also incredibly important. And I think that does that communication. Sorry, that's another, I've got the three C's and I'd forgotten that one in particular. I think communication is absolutely vital. Our role as musicians is to try to pass through time something of the feeling that was in the composer, the earlier performers, to the modern performers, and to the audience and the audience if they feel that joy they feel that connectivity then I think they relate better to one another as well I like to see people in the audience chatting with one another over a glass of wine and discussing what went on we don't mind if people want to clap at the wrong point in the concert it doesn't matter as long as they are participants that's another thing that's very important to us we do enjoy having concerts where with a, doing a workshop in advance, we can in, allow amateur musicians to participate alongside professional musicians in the concert. So everything is about getting a feeling of society, friendship, family. Thank you very much. And one last question to Noelia before we go to the questions of the ensembles. What about phones, mobile phones? and attention what do you think about that well i maybe because because i have a child that i'm i'm fighting every day about about phones and screens i i think they they are a big distractor for for people for everybody but all the, at the same time i understand that the the era we are we are living at, uh, we need the phone. It's kind of a part of our body already. And I I find myself also with the phone in the concerts sometimes. When you get excited, you want to take a picture. You want to to save a video so you can share it. That's a natural thing right now. And therefore, therefore, I we allow the phones at the concerts. They have to be silent. But we allow people to to screen. I don't know if that was a question, but we allow people to share, to 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 record, uh, and to to be able to share it if they want, because I have found that it's it's kind of a need for for especially for young audiences. 
Thank you, thank you, Noelia. Uh, if you don't want to add anything, Mateo or Deborah, we will go for the questions of the ensembles um, because uh, they have been here. Now the question is, how can they help? How can the the ensembles, the young ensembles in this case, be? How can they be your allies to 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 get these new audiences and to 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 engage them and to build stories? So we will start with the ensemble Baba Rocco, uh, with Nico. Hi. Yeah. So our question was, um, how important is the format of a proposal when uh, choosing an ensemble for for a concert? Mateo. Wow, I love that question. <laughs> so I usually spend three seconds on any new email that I receive. Um, uh, you might be surprised, um, but you know, it's very important to be short and to avoid as much as possible all digital interaction with a promoter, even though it's also crucial, you know, sending a PDF. It, is that what you wanted to hear? Like the format of your proposal that has been sent to an artistic director, maybe? We're more thinking about um, the type of concert, uh, amount of musicians program, but that that's interesting as well, actually. We did not thought about that. Okay, so I think it's crucial to um, to be specific for the festival you are you would like to work for, and therefore make a project uh, which is customized according to the recipient of your of your proposal, and that might reach multiple festivals. So, as I was saying, if you do something greeny, if your story is greeny, let's say, I don't know, anything related to the environment, that will reach so many festivals. I know it's hard to think, like, I'm playing early music, how can I do any environmental project? I know that's, you know, because as a musician, I was always also very much focused on um, practicing and challenging myself for a more challenging repertoire. So uh, for me, the story is important and choose a story that can be um, flexible for different festivals so that I can send the propo 10 proposals and maybe one will uh, accept my proposal. But also it's important the way I interact with um, the festival manager. As I was saying, people don't have much time to write, to read. And uh, a very cool, expensive picture sometimes is worthier than a hundred pages. Um, and you know, there's so much di digital interaction. And I'm a freelance. I work for other institutions, promoting. You know, being from the side of the artist instead. And I always find the phone call great and vintage and you know, like, it's the best. Like, and this guy will say, oh, this guy called me. Like, really? Nowadays? Still, there is somebody calling somebody else. Investing on Skype, on Zoom, on, you know, um, dialing instead of WhatsApp uh, makes the relationship more efficient. Artistic directors have many friends, so they usually... Uh, have their circle of friendships and it's difficult to uh, reach out to people who are out of the circle. You know, each institution has a, a background, a heritage of relationships. So the relationship, uh, if well-maintained, might take a few years, but uh, will bear its own fruits if it's based on, you know, face-to-face, -face, even if distant, calling and sending short emails and then calling again after six months. And sometimes I visit people, I pay my flights and combine my holidays in a way that I can do my work, but also enjoy my own private life. And some things happen in a way that people hire my artistic products 
and uh, you know, relationships go on. So I'm going longer and longer. I'll stop it here. Thank you, Matteo. We have also a question from Livia from Entrevescant. Hi. So uh, I think you already got our questions and we talk a bit about what we asked uh, earlier. So I have kind of reformulated something for now. So I think um, the question would be, uh, what are specific situations that you would be willing to accept as promoters and specific situations that go out of the classic format concept, I mean, and how to approach promoters with proposals that might take them a bit out of their comfort zone and require a bit of extra effort and carry some risk, like no safety hazard, but um, if we experiment, it might not work and people might not like uh, the, the new thing that the promoter and the group are proposing. Can you, Livia, put some examples of a specific situations or specific risks? Yeah, for example, uh, imagine we present our program, but apart for of us, we have, I don't know, uh, no, we don't have anyone else. We are just us, but there's going to be dancing and people are going to be moving around. Uh, maybe some people, some promoters, won't upset that because their space is not good for that because there's no place to move or because they would have to go through the effort of removing all the chairs. And maybe we go a bit farther and we want to carry with us a DJ or a dancer. Uh, how far can can you go that way? How far, how far can they go, uh, Noelia? <laughs> well, uh... I already said before that I would push the limit, so I have to keep on my track now. <laughs> I, I would say that uh, what Mateo just said about the relation, about calling, asking, uh, would give you some clues. Because I'm sure, I mean, every director is different and every festival is different. Some places, I, I'm sure there are many places that you wouldn't even think of. Uh, presenting a proposal that is a different one from the regular concert that we all know. But there are other places that are open to it. And I think here the three of us are invited here for something. <laughs> and and so I think that's a, that's another part of the work that you have to do as an artist. This, uh, we were saying at the beginning no? that it, it takes a lot of energy is promoting yourself, which is, is part of it, because if not, you won't be playing at it. It doesn't make sense to practice anymore. But I, I think it's important to maybe like to classify a little bit which kind of festivals are one way, the other way, and you can have different ideas and different proposals uh, depending on, on the festival. So that that's why I think the, the, the key word would be flexibility or being someone who is able to adapt to new situations or to play as old situations in the, in the best quality you have. To have both things would be the best. Thank you. And about, sorry, because you were saying, what happens if it doesn't work? I think that's mm, uh, the, the responsible there is the promoter and, and that's part of the job, this risk and this decision of making this kind of festival or the other. That's that's our responsibility. Don't worry about it. You have to go to the end of what you proposed and try to do your best there. And, and yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Noelia. Uh, I don't know if we can go to, to the next question or Deborah want to add something. Yes, she does. And also Mateo. Okay. Oh, yeah, sorry. Very, very briefly. Um, we have had some near disasters because um, technical disasters because we do take risks and we love people to come up with exciting ideas. But <laughs> the important thing is when you're approaching a promoter, don't send them a blanket email. Don't send the same thing to every promoter. I say this every year on our training sessions. Do your research, know your promoters and target the ones you think are going to take the sort of work that you want to do. And 
get to know them, develop a relationship with them, find out what their health and safety rules are and what their budgets are. This is vital. So many people don't think about what these things cost. So think about all of those things and then just communicate, communicate, communicate. And I'm sure you work something out with them. That's very interesting, Deborah. Thank you. And actually, this is, as as we said, one of the objectives. Uh, learn how to and communicate with promoters and learn how do you think what do you seek? And, and this is one of the of the main things that we are working here. Mateo, you wanted to say something also. Yeah, yeah thank you. So shortly, um, in order to invest money on people that are, especially people that I don't know, I need to trust. And that happens in any field of life, not just arts and music. It happens with the doctor or anybody else. So... Uh, I am making present graphic presentations for other projects I'm freelancing in a way that first page, this is who I am. Page two, this is what I do. Page three, uh, this is where I did it. I've already done it. There's no big risk for you to embarrass your audience. Page four, these are a few references from local newspapers or pictures from events that I've already done or my the mayor of my city, my town, my village, who, who says how cool I am. And not me, I'm telling myself, hey, look how cool I am. So I think these you know, few patterns, uh, who I am, what I do, where I did it, and somebody else giving me references i will trust you more you were uh and travis can you were talking about how uh, how risky should be the format and before that barbara you were also asking me maybe maybe i didn't answer uh how the for the concert format should it be the presentation you know should be should we be dancing or interacting while singing with the audience that is part of the dialogue with the artistic director I think building trust, uh, telling an artistic director that you have done what you are proposing already uh, will be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo, very much. We have two questions more from the ensembles, and the next one is from Beth from Flutes and Frets. So we've talked a bit about, about this. Um, but in terms of artists communicating with directly with the audience, um, what are your experiences? What have you tried? What hasn't worked? What has worked in terms of artists talking to the audience before the concert, during, afterwards? Do you leave space in the concerts for the audience to ask questions either during or, or after the concerts? Um, yeah, how has that worked in your experience? I think it was Matteo, the one who, who said that they always speak. So maybe you want to answer that, Matteo. Just shortly so I can have Deborah or Noelia answer also. Yeah, like hearing the voice is such a big gift, you know. It's a huge gift. Hear your voice and hear the reasons why you made the, the choices that you made because you, you chose an, a, re a repertoire just to play with somebody else also. I have this, uh, where is it? This quartet, they were like teasing each other on stage because they are from different parts of Italy. The one is from Naples, the other one is from the North and people from the North, you know. Also getting some personality out of uh, the um, average speeches uh, about repertoire or, um, you know, composers that i think it always works and um, i may add something else but you know maybe it's nice to exchange our emails and keep the conversation along i will let deborah and noelia maybe answer 
for sure we will give you the image of the four ensembles that you can connect them and uh, yeah yeah let's keep the conversation afterwards it's actually we are talking not only now but uh, also in the I don't know in the swimming pool, but in the in the <laughs> in the time during the activities. Deborah Noelia, you want to add something? Please, Deborah. Yeah, I, I missed some of that because I, I keep disappearing. Um I'm in a hotel at the moment and, and I'm on their Wi-Fi because I'm on holiday, believe it or not. Um I absolutely love it if artists speak to the audience, but I absolutely can't bear it if they witter on for ages. Um, it's do, do you know what I mean? Sorry, I'm very aware that not everybody here is a native English speaker. Um, choose in your ensemble the person who's best at speaking and plan it carefully. And some people just talk, 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 and you just want them to stop. So plan it out, choose the best person, but make everything you say count. That, I'm sorry, I, I hope that answered the question. I, as I say, I didn't hear all of the question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very, very precious to hear that. Um, and it has been also part of our discussions here in ECOS. Noelia, what do you think about that? I I was going to add uh, mostly what Deborah just said. It's very important. I think it's uh, mandatory to talk to be able to to listen to the to the to the ensemble as well. It it's good to choose one person and it's important not to talk too much or to, to try to see how to talk, the intonation, because it shows personality as well. If you, it's not just, I just have to talk because, because it's good to talk. No, it has to have meaning. If not, it's better not to do it. So it's important to, to rehearse very well that part as well. Yeah. <laughs> Can I add something, Jorge, is there time? Please. Okay, thanks. So I think before talking about this, I. I focus about the meaning of connection and connection can be either emotional and physical. So when I play, I establish an, an emotional connection. And, you know, I can also make an added value, an additional value working on physical connection. I can do that with my voice when I'm on stage, but personally uh, playing the violin, my choice, my choice is to go off stage at the end of the concert and go, the last row you know at the exit or entrance and stop talking i leave my violin and i talk with the audience and people love it so much that's very nice uh mateo thank you let's listen to santiago from the gardeners so our question was um quite simple um what, as promoters, what kind of format did you experience in general? New formats that you've been trying, uh, which worked? What did you find? What did you experience that had an effect and you feel that it kind of uh, opened something that uh, gives a lot of possibilities, let's say? Who wants to answer first? Deborah, maybe? Oh, that is a very, very difficult, it's a very good question, but very difficult because we experimented with so many. One of my favorite kind of standard, non-standard uh, ones is this sort of cafe format where everybody's seated at a table and the performers are in the center and they can move around the tables as well. Um, we haven't done that for a long time um, the pandemic sort of blew that out of the water for a while. And it does mean that you're reducing the number of people that you can actually get in. So I'm, I'm often vetoed by people of uh, people who are concerned about the income for, for ticket sales, but it does work very, very nicely. I remember the coffee cantata of Bach that we did that. And it was costumed and it was beautiful and there were lovely cakes and cups of coffee and everything like that and it was really stunning and you really felt the audience was so close because they were coming and sitting at the tables and being a part of of the audience and the audience really loved this so I would say you've got to choose one I'd say that cafe or um, cabaret format 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if Matteo or Noelia want to add something before our gold, golden minute uh, and to end these conversations today. Noelia? Well, I was going to say about the, the concerts that are in, in the nature. Uh, this format that uh, we there there is one concert that we do every day every year um, with the with this castle that we have in Segovia that's, the Alcázar is a very beautiful castle and people are sitting on the green they are there are no chairs some people already go with their with their chairs and they they bring their own chairs but mainly people bring some towels or places where they are sitting on the green on the grass sorry and and that's really and and that's really cool people like that for instance mm. i'm sure they do um mateo maybe you want to add something or we go to the final round it looks like a presidential debate i know but <laughs> so i wow. want to thank you all all the all the ensembles for this very nice conversations all the promoters debora noelia mateo for for sharing with us um this knowledge and these ideas we we hope we can uh implement their, them some of them in the in our festivals i hope a lot of promoters and and ensembles will will benefit from that and i invite you to for the for the um, uh, next conversation which is with Jan van der Boge from M Ma Festival Bruch, Josep Barcon from Spooners Baroques uh, in Catalonia and Susan Ryan from Bloomington Early Music Festival where we'll talk about what remains after a concert but what will remain from today is the last minute of interventions I would like you to talk to the ensembles and to to give them a uh, a, a brief uh, message to to keep with this idea of finding new audiences and new ally alliance alliances to to find uh, new ways to explore and to promote early music. Uh, Deborah, if you want to start. Okay, so it's only a minute. What I will say is, whatever program you come up with and whatever relationship you end up with the promoter help them to promote your concert because you are far, far more likely to be um, with social media, to have contact with your own generation. And you'll often find that promoters don't have the expertise all the time to do that. We are battling with that quite a lot at the moment. In fact, as a festival, we're even doing, a, I think, some tuition in making more of social media but it is so wonderful if as artists you come in not just with a program but with an idea of how to help promote it that's very nice Deborah thank you very much Noelia from Fundación Juan de Borbón well I I would like to encourage the groups to to connect with the with the directors with the promoters and to build those relationships we were talking about, because I I think it's sometimes a lot of time that you lose or, or that you waste when you when you create uh, a, your own proposals besides the festivals that you are going to present in them uh, too. And we were talking about connection and about about flexibility on the on the proposals, and I think all those have to be built also depending on the festivals that you are going to present them. And, and yeah, that would be my idea. Thank you, Deborah. And Matteo uh, from Lugo Festival. Hi, guys. Um, uh, so can I make some questions with no answers, just provocations, politely? Yes, you can. Okay, I love that. Um, so I'm making a list of questions, trying to respect my golden minute so that you can reflect and I can also reflect. Does your project has a vision? Um, do I want to promote my project or do I know somebody who could do that? What message am I trying to spread in this world? I think that's it. Oh, last question, last question. Sustainability, always the key of everything. 
do I know a company that could sponsor my local slash international projects for any percentage of the expenses, 15, 50, in a way that I can be interesting to international programmers, telling them, hey, half of my expenses are already covered by these great companies. You know, private corporates have a lot of money to invest in young people, green. They just, they're just waiting in their office for somebody to ask them, honestly. You know, uh, I'll stop it here. That was uh, very nice. Uh, we will keep these questions and we will talk them in the swimming pool tonight. But now we have to finish this um, these conversations. Uh, so thank you very much uh, from Brighton, from Segovia, uh, from Italy, from Lugo, I guess, uh, and here from Aledo. I have to thank then again to the University of Murcia, Territorio Serra Spuña, and also Creative Europe for sponsoring Next Generation, for sponsoring that, all the ensembles, all the team, and see you tomorrow uh, in the next Echos Lab. Thank you. Ciao. Keep in touch.